Chapter 1 The Devil on Asase It was only millions of years ago when the seraphim children from the sky arrived on Asase to seed the planet with plant and animal life, which included the evolving hominids. Kwaku Anansi returned from the farm to meet his tribesmen, who were gathered at the chief's palace. A misfortune had befallen the Osono clan of Asase. A strange sickness had sent five people of the clan to their graves, within hours of their having fallen ill. One of the victims was Kuwaku Anansi's one and only son in Takuma. Kuwaku Anansi broke down in tears when he heard the shocking news of his son's death. He had never before wept so deeply. The clan members all gathered around Anansi to console him, but no one was able to stop the tears from flowing from his eyes, which kept up for hours. Intakuma was the only nuclear family member that Anansi had in Asase, so the boy's death was a very big blow to the father. The entire clan was living in fear of this strange phenomenon. They didn't know who was going to be the next victim. Just a month ago, the entire township had suffered from crop failure when locusts descended from nowhere, invading their farms and destroying the entire maize farm belonging to the Asono clan. The chief of the Asono clan in the land of Asase addressed his people and assured them that their god would intervene in a timely manner to arrest the situation. Kawaku Anansi, who had joined the gathering during the chief's address, left the meeting grounds and headed to the oracle of the god of the Asono clan to determine the specific cause of the menace that was bringing this series of misfortunes to his people. At the oracle, the god, through his priest, informed Kawaku Anansi that the origin of the disaster was the evil forest in the land of Asase. Kawaku Anansi was famed as a great farmer and hunter. He had two pets that had been with him since his descent on the land of Asase as a newborn child. He went nowhere without these two pets, Mens Mentis and Emovere. Kawaku Anansi made a decision only after consulting with Mens Mentis, and he acted only when Emovere propelled his body to do so. Mens Mentis and Emovere had become like animal gods to Kawaku Anansi. Mens Mentis analyzed an issue presented to him through Kuwaku Anansi's senses, and then later presented his analysis to Kuwaku Anansi so the latter could take a decision. When Kuwaku Anansi expressed his will in the form of a command, Emovere picked up the command and thence commanded Kuwaku Anansi's body into action. Kuwaku Anansi then said in his heart, I shall meet the devil face to face, and we shall see which one of us perishes. Emovere then spoke, Feel how passionate you are for the welfare of your people. Feel how angry you have become. Go and defeat the devil. Kawaku Anansi then said to the priest of the god of the Asono clan, I will enter the evil forest and destroy the devil, and I shall replace the sorrow in our land with joy. The priest of the oracle said, We have lost enough souls in this evil forest, and we are loath to sacrifice any more. Think deeply about the decision you will take, for no one has ever entered the evil forest and returned alive. The day that you take the first step into the evil forest shall become your last. I speak not for myself, as I am just a vessel. Kawaku Anansi considered the warning of the priest, yet Emovere said, Let's proceed to the evil forest. Kawaku Anansi then left the shrine and headed to the chief's palace where the chief and the people had gathered in mourning for those lost. He bowed before his chief and announced his decision to embark on his fateful journey. The chief and the elders of the town became very troubled of heart when they heard his words. The chief rose from his seat and headed to his room, saddened by the fate that he thought awaited Kawaku Anansi in the evil forest. The people became confused and distressed when their chief left their midst without explanation. Kawaku Anansi then addressed the people, saying, My people of Asase, I have decided to pursue the evil one in the forest. I shall return with his head in my hand, and that shall symbolize the end of our suffering. The crowd's dismay was apparent. One among them spoke for them all, saying, Do not leave us and perish in that forest, which takes so many of the brave and the wise among our people. 
Please stay with us, for we do not desire even one more of our kind to perish. We beg you to stay, brave son of Asase. After conversing with Mens Mentis, Kawaka Wanansei spoke to the crowd. My decision I have already taken, and I am not looking back. All I need from you now is your prayers. I am no longer counted among the living. My name is already recorded in the Book of the Dead. Having spoken, he began to move in the direction of the evil forest, when the chief of his clan emerged from his room and spoke. Brave young seeker of the unknown, you cannot face the devil without these, he said, handing him a bow and a full quiver. You shall need them when you come face to face with evil. Kawaku Anansei accepted the bow and quiver and thanked the chief. Then the chief's mother, matriarch of the Asono clan, spoke. Brave son of our land, without strength you cannot use the bow and arrow should you come face to face with evil. Take with you this food and water, for you shall need them before your journey's end. After thanking the queen, he accepted the gift of mangoes, bananas, pineapples and oranges, and a gourd containing water. He wrapped them all in a cloth and tied it to one end of a long stick. Then he hung the bow on his shoulder and tied the quiver to his waist. The blacksmith gave him a freshly sharpened sword. Kwaka Wanansei carried the food and water tied to one end of the stick on his shoulder and headed towards the evil forest. The high priest, together with the people of Asase, followed him with prayers and tears of sorrow. They all stopped when Kawaka Wanansei reached the threshold of the evil forest. He addressed his people for the last time, saying, I have reached the threshold of life and death, the beginning of my journey. Shall my beginning indeed become my end? And shall my first step become my last step? As I have come, so I shall leave you. Alone we have all come, and alone we shall all depart, although I have chosen a shorter path. I have chosen this path so that I shall serve as an example unto you. The more loving you are, the greater the responsibility you must shoulder. I embark on a journey without being certain of my destination. The brave man is one who embraces the darkest future. The darkest thing in the world is the future. No one can see what it contains. The courageous man is one who deserves stronger legs. The timid man is one who sits in contemplation of the good things of yesterday. How can there be progress when there is fear of the unknown? Many are the obstacles that await the man who walks the lonely path. I shall surely journey this path because the seed of the journey I have long since sown in the shrine of our God. Shall the high priest nurture it with tears of my joy or tears of my sorrow? I know not the fruit born in the womb of time. The seed has sprouted from the soil of our God, and this is all I know with certainty as of yet. Whether it shall bear a poisonous fruit, or the juice of its fruit shall become nectar unto my body, I know not, for what is certain has passed, belonging to the treasures of yesterday. I am about to harvest the fruit of my own seed in the unknown. If no one enters and comes back alive, who shall report the findings of that which has remained hidden to the people of Asase? The people of Asase will otherwise continue to live in fear and darkness. Our own land we fear to explore. Who is the foreigner whom we await to shed light on our ignorance? When there is weed in our backyard, do we invite our neighbors to clear it? The time has come to embrace the unknown. I have spent my youth with you. The rest of my life... I will spend in pursuit of the unknown that lies hidden in the depth of this great ocean that lies before me. I cannot enter and swim with my clothes on me. Naked I enter. I therefore leave my clothes for you to keep, people of Asase. When I sink and never return, let my clothes be unto you the symbol of my love. I am about to sacrifice my body for the greater good of my people. Be united, like the individual threads that lost their uniqueness to form my clothes. You shall become more useful than the individual threads that you formerly were. I am aware of the risk that awaits me on this journey that I embark on. No one embarks on a journey that the heart is ignorant of. Hidden in each man's heart is the map of his journey. If death is my destination, then so shall it be. 
for that shall become the final destination of every man born from the womb of the unknown. From the unknown we have come, and to the unknown we shall all return. I have tasted enough of that which is called life in the land of Asase. I have tasted her food and drunk her water. I have lain with her beautiful daughters at night. Fornicator and sinner I am. I have given alms to Asase's needy palms. Many more things, good and bad, I have done that I do not remember. As new leaves are born, so shall old leaves die to make room. Is death not the companion of life in the wheel of progress? How can a tree bear new leaves when old leaves do not give way to new leaves? And how can the tree bear fruit when the new leaves continue to dance an eternal dance in the sunlight without coming to rest in the peaceful bed of death? Even the great sun itself rests in the west after a day's journey from the east. Permit me to say that death and life are the two legs of progress. Each has to be repeated in movement if there is to be forward movement or progress. Are my sins going to hunt me now that I decide to leave them behind? What about my good works? Will they come and reward me during my time of need? Will they lead me as my walking stick or face me from the east as the rising sun in order to brighten the path that is before me? But I cannot face the rising sun without a shadow being cast at my back. Shall I move towards the east and meet the rising sun at midday, or shall I wait in devotion for the light to approach me? If my progress is going to be determined by the length of the shadow I cast on the ground, then the middle way entices me with more promise than the earlier two paths. So which of the voices shall I heed? The high priest then spoke. We cannot give you answers to your numerous questions. We followed you here, but we did not bring you here. Even if we had brought the horse to the river's side, we couldn't have forced it to drink the water. We cannot decide for you. The decision is yours to make. We can only pray for those who choose to tread the path of the brave and the wise. It is not too late to return with us. But when you take the first step into the evil forest, it will be. Ponder deeply before you take the next step, either towards the north or back to the south. When you move forward, remember not to look back, for that is the sign of indecision, the act of a coward. The dog barks not to attack, but to gauge the vulnerability of the intended prey. When you show it courage, it flees. But when you show it cowardice, it attacks. Beware! The demons of Asase wait patiently at the door to thy soul, waiting for a sign to enter the door, in order to accompany you on your journey. When you show them fear, they shall happily enter to devour you. I have spoken enough. Now you stand at the threshold of life and death. The next step is yours to take. Having spoken, the high priest turned back and moved towards the main town, the crowds following him. Kowaku and Nanse then took a bold step into the evil forest. The forest was very thick, with many wild plants. With the aid of a stick Kwako Anansi found on the ground, he hacked his way through the thick forest. He had started the journey two hours after midday. After continuously walking for a period of five hours, he rested under a neem tree and ate some food and drank some water. He climbed a nearby oil palm tree and brought down some of its branches to prepare a bed. He rested his body, as he was very tired after his long walk. After Kawako Anansi had rested a while, Mens Mentis said to him, For how long are we going to travel before we meet this devil, which we know not whether it be man or animal? Then Emovere said, Let's continue the journey before our food runs out. Kawako Anansi rose from the palm bed and continued his journey. After a day of walking, when night drew closer, Mens Mentis told Kawako Anansi, We cannot continue walking in the dark. Let's set up a shelter and rest till morning. Kwaku Anansi saw other oil palm trees. He cut some of the branches and prepared a simple shelter for the night. He ate some pineapples and drank a little water to wash down their juice, grateful to the chief's mother. He tied the remaining food and water in the cloth and lay inside his shelter. 
He had a good sleep and awoke before sunrise. In the morning, Mens Mentis said to him, Why don't we set up a stronger shelter that we can use as our abode till we meet the devil? Kawakuanansi said in his heart that it was a good idea. Then Emilvere said to him, Let's prepare the shelter now. So Kawakuanansi began to cut down more branches of the oil palm tree to prepare a stronger shelter. Being skilled in the art of building, he was able to set up a shelter that was pleasing to his own eyes. He was tired after building his shelter, so he ate some of the bananas and drank a little water. He realized that he was running out of food. So Mens Mentis advised him to begin searching for food and water in the evil forest. Kwakuanansi hid his remaining food in the shelter and began an expedition to seek sustenance. On his journey, he cut down several plants to enable him to trace his way back to his shelter. He hunted east and hunted west, but he could not see any sign of food or water. Thus, he returned back to his shelter dismayed. He was very thirsty and hungry after the hunt for food, so he consumed his last rations. In the night, while Kawaku Inanse was resting in the shelter, Mens Mentis conversed with him, saying, Are you going to die of hunger in this forest? Why don't you return to the people of Asase? There is so much food there that you can enjoy. No, that would be the act of a coward. Kawaku Inanse spoke, or should I return with the lie that I have killed the devil? They shall demand the head of the devil as evidence. It shall become a great curse on me and my generations to come should they realize that I had lied to them. Or should I die here and forever be remembered by my people as a hero? Kuwaku Anansi decided in his heart that it is better to die a hero than to live as a coward. I refuse to be conquered by this forest. I shall conquer it because I am a conqueror. He decided to rise and go for a walk. The moment he stepped out of his shelter, he noticed some movement in a nearby bush. He quickly went inside to get his bow and arrows. He did not wait for the movement to pursue him. He quietly pursued it. Mens Mentis asked him, Is this the devil or an animal for food? As Kawaku Anansi was pursuing the movement, he realized that the thing causing the movement was heading towards him. He then hid silently behind a nearby neem tree to wait for the stranger. After some minutes, the stranger emerged as an elephant. The elephant stopped moving and then carefully approached the tree shielding Kawaku Anansi, as if it had sensed his presence. There was an atmosphere of quiet for some minutes, neither Kawaku Anansi nor the elephant moving. Kawaku Anansi eventually looked behind the tree and realized that the elephant was bleeding at one of its legs. It looked as if it had been attacked by some wild creatures in the forest. He cautiously approached the creature, trying to sense any sign that the animal would attack. The elephant did not make any aggressive move towards him, so he trusted it and touched its head. The elephant replied by closing its eyes as a gesture of friendship and trust. Kuaku Anansi quickly searched for herbs that he could use to treat the wound. Managing to find some herbs, he chewed them up and applied them to the wound. The bleeding stopped soon after he had done so. The elephant passed its trunk across Kuaku Anansi's body and ran back into the forest. Kuaku Anansi went back into his shelter to ponder on the origin of the elephant. An hour after it had left, the elephant returned with a huge watermelon in its trunk. It gave the fruit to Kawaku Anansi and quickly left, moving in the direction from whence it came. Kawaku Anansi cut the watermelon into two, ate half, and kept the other half for the evening. An hour later, the elephant returned again with two bunches of bananas, one ripe and the other not. It gave them to Kawaku Anansi and once again headed back in the direction it had come from. Kawaku Anansi ate some of the ripe bananas and then entered his shelter to rest. While he rested, Mens Mentis addressed him, asking, What would happen should this elephant stop visiting? Why don't you follow it to where it has been harvesting those fruits? Kwaku Anansi knew in his heart that it was a good idea. He waited for the elephant to return so that he could follow it to where it had been harvesting the fruits. Three days passed, but he did not see any sign of the elephant. He became worried. When Kwaku Anansi ran out of food, he went to an oil palm and took some of its fruits for food. 
For a period of three days, he relied on the food of the oil palm tree. He used some of the leaves of the tree to prepare a broom, which he used every morning to tidy his new home. One day a strong wind came and blew down his shelter. He became very angry and cursed the wind, saying, You shall never have a place to rest. See what you have done to my shelter? Even an ant has a place to lay its head. How much more should a son of man have? Your evil intention I shall surely defeat. For I shall build a beautiful shelter that your envious eyes cannot behold, one that your might cannot overcome. He prepared a new shelter within a period of three days. The new shelter was indeed more beautiful and stronger than the old one. The day after he had finished constructing his new shelter, he was resting in front of it when he spotted two tigers approaching him. He quickly moved inside his shelter and barred the door. The tigers tried with all their might to bring down his shelter in order to devour him, but all their attempts were futile. The shelter was too strong. They soon returned from whence they came. Kawaku Anansi then thanked the wind that destroyed the old shelter for giving him reason to build a stronger shelter. A week later, a very heavy rain poured down, flooding the entire vicinity of Kawaku Anansi's shelter. He cursed the rain, saying, You shall never have a place to rest. See what you have done to my shelter? Even an ant has a place to lay its head. How much more should a son of man have? Your evil intention I shall surely defeat. I am going to build a more beautiful shelter than your envious eyes cannot behold, one beyond even your reach. He carried his belongings from the shelter and went in search of a hill or mountain. Within hours he found a hill which he climbed. For a period of three days he set up a new shelter. During a subsequent seven-day period on the hill, he continued visiting the palm oil tree to eat its fruit and the food contained within its seed. When the fruit was gone from the tree, he called it useless, felled it to ground, and dug a hole in it to extract the sap, which he intended to use for fermented palm wine. He put a calabash under the hole to collect the sap. He went to his shelter and decided to give the palm sap time to ferment, wanting to enjoy an alcohol-rich palm wine. When the day came for him to go and retrieve his palm wine from under the palm tree, he set out on the trek. On his way, he saw two gnomes sitting on a log. These two gnomes were Ingratus and Memor. They invited Kawaku Anansi to come and drink with them. Kawaku Anansi responded that he was a religious man and thus eschewed alcohol. They then asked him whether he was the one who had felled the palm tree. He responded that he knew not the palm tree they were talking about. Kawaku Anansi then asked them why they were concerned about the palm tree that they were talking about. Ingratus and Memor told him that the fallen palm tree used to be their habitat. When the three finished their brief conversation, Kawaku Anansi continued his journey to the fallen palm tree and drank all the palm wine collected in his calabash. He changed his direction home because he didn't want to meet Ingratus and Memor on the way. To his surprise, he met them seated as before on his new route. He was drunk and had been happily singing and dancing when they saw him. Memor asked him why he was so happy. He said to him that he had taken palm wine from a useless tree he had felled. Memor asked him why he had lied about abstaining from alcohol. He never answered but continued dancing and singing. Then Ingratus asked him why he called the palm tree useless, after it had given him food in the forest. He never answered him, but continued dancing. Ingratus and Memor took a stone between them and threw it to hit Kwaku Anansi's ankle. Crying out loud as the two scuttled off into the bushes, he asked, What have I done that these little men punish me so hard? On his eleventh day on the hill, Kawaku Anansi decided to rest in front of his shelter. He scanned as far as he could see from the vantage point of his hill. At noon, he noticed a bright light in the northern part of the forest. Because he had made up his mind not to journey that day, he didn't make any attempt to investigate that which caused the brightness in the evil forest. When night came, he had a dream. 
In his dream, he saw himself on a farm where he was harvesting crops. After the harvest, he prepared some food and ate it. He then found himself at his home in Asase. He tried to open the door to his room, but realized that he didn't have the key to do so. He therefore sat under a mango tree to rest. While he was resting, a man and a little girl approached him and asked him why he was sitting under the mango tree. He told them he could not find the key to his room. The man gave him a key, and the little girl also gave him a key. After taking the keys from the two people, who were personally known to him in his community in Asase, as Helios and Perse, respectively, he went to the door to try the keys. When he reached the entrance, the two keys in his hand became one. He inserted the key into the keyhole and opened the door. In the dream, he went inside and was about to sleep on his bed when he awoke from sleep. Just then, Mens Mentis asked him, What message did these two people seek to deliver? Helios is a carpenter in Asase, and Perse is that little girl who was born recently to the baker. You don't have any special relationship with these two people. Why then do you dream about them? What do these two people have in common that they appear in your dream? If the key represents a solution, what wisdom do these two people have that surpasses the wisdom of Koaku Anansi? Koaku Anansi rose up from his bed after listening to the silent speech of Mens Mentis. It was morning and Koaku Anansi was very hungry. He stood in front of his house to see if he could behold the brightness he had seen the other day, but it had gone. He waited until it was noon, at which time he went to stand there again to see whether he could behold the light. To his surprise, he saw the radiation again. He therefore descended the hill and headed in the direction of the light. Upon reaching the location, he found no light, only a freshwater swamp forest. He became happy when he found water in the evil forest because he was very thirsty. He bowed down and drank some of the water. Thereafter, he thanked the rain that had forced him to relocate to the top of the hill. As soon as he finished thanking the rain and was about to leave, he saw a swarm of bees coming to attack him. He dived into the swamp and swam until he reached the other side of the swamp forest. To his amazement, he saw a very beautiful garden just beyond the swamp, with all kinds of beautiful trees. The garden was blessed with all kinds of fruits, such as berries, mangoes, apples, bananas, and pineapples. The entire floor of the garden was covered with beautiful flowers. Hypericum, berry, gloriosa lily, anemone, anthurium, mocara orchids, gladiolus, ranunculus, peony, ginger, alstromeria, gerbera daisy, carnation, and rose. When he saw the beauty, variety, and quantity of the fruits, he took more than he could eat. When he had finished eating, he plucked as many as he could and tied them in a cloth. On his way home, he saw two gnomes sitting on a log. Kwaku and Anse greeted them. Once they responded, he asked, Have you come to punish me like you did the other time? One of them replied, My brother is Avaritia, and I am Liberalitus. We don't remember ever teaching you in this forest. Kawaka Winanse said, Sorry then. You look like some little men I once met. Avaritia asked Kwaku Winanse to give him some of his fruit. Kwaku Winanse told him that the fruits belonged to him and his family, so there wasn't enough to share with them. Avaritia asked him where his wife and children lived. Kawaku Anansi pointed to the top of the hill and told Avaritia that they lived with him there. Liberalitus asked him to extend his regards to his wife and children. Kawaku Anansi promised to deliver the message. He wished them goodbye and headed home. When Kawaku Anansi reached home and was about to eat the fruits, the gnomes appeared before him and greeted him. They told him that they had come to personally say hello to his wife and children because they had never spotted them in the forest. Kwaku Anansi told them his wife and children had gone out to fetch water. The gnomes left, only to come back later. Upon their return, they realized that Kwaku Anansi had eaten most all of the fruits and was about to eat the last one. 
They asked him why he had lied to them when he told them that the fruits were for him and his family, and he said it was because the fruits were too beautiful to share with others. Liberalitus, who had a rod in his hand, gave him 21 lashes and advised him to be generous. Early in the morning, Kawaka Wenonse realized that he was very sick. As a result, he couldn't go out the whole day. He vomited and felt very cold. Mens Mentis told him, You have allowed greed to override your conscience. See how you are suffering? After that day, Kawaku Anansei experienced a comfortable stay in the garden for a period of one month. One day, on his way home after gathering fruits and nuts in the garden beyond the swamp, lightning struck his shelter on the hill. The entire shelter caught fire and burned to ashes. When he saw what the lightning had done to his shelter, he cursed the lightning, saying, Where do you expect a son of man to lay his head? Even the ant has a place to sleep. May the curse of the Asase god come on you. Shame on you. Your evil purpose I shall defeat. I shall set up a new shelter near the water in the garden that your envious eyes cannot behold. And when you strike it again, I shall have enough water to put your fire out. Now that he had nothing to call his belonging except his cutlass, he went to find a location to set up a new shelter close to the swamp. He said in his heart, I shall set up a new shelter in this garden, and it shall become my final place of abode in this forest. He stood at a place in the garden that he considered to be an appropriate spot for him to set up his garden. He scanned through the garden to see if he could find a good tree to use for his new shelter. A certain tree in the middle of the garden came to his attention. The tree had three branches. He found a snake coiled in the spot where the three branches met. The snake was in deep sleep and did not show any sign of life. Kawaku Inanse used his sword to touch the snake in order to wake it. The instant he touched the snake with the cutlass, the snake raised its head and asked, Why have you awakened me from my slumber, sir? Kawako Anansei replied, I have come to kill you, speaking snake. Your ability to speak suggests to me that you are not an ordinary snake, but the very devil in this forest that I have traveled far to slay. The snake asked Kawako Anansei, Why do you call this forest evil when it has fed you and sheltered you? Kawaku Anansei replied, I call this forest evil because it is the abode of you, the speaking snake. I am in a hurry to carry the good news to my people. Say your last words before I slay you with the cutlass I hold in my hand. The snake said to Kawaku Anansei, A very old serpent I am. Long have I waited to be killed by a son of man. Before you slay me with your cutlass, give me the opportunity to sing a song to this garden, which has accommodated me for a long period of time. Kawaku Anansei said, Sing your last song before I slay you with this cutlass. The snake began singing the following lyrics. Onufu is my name. The Ancient Ones honored me as the bringer of knowledge and immortality because I gave them the Soma of the Gods and journeyed with them through the God Lands. From the south they came. To the north we went till they became ubiquitous at the end of their journey. Now I have fallen from my place of honor and have become a symbol of evil. The place of my abode is now called the Forbidden Forest. I sing my last song to this garden. This is my last song, for the Son of Man is about to slay me with his cutlass. I die in peace with my secret knowledge of wisdom and immortality. After hearing the song of Onufu, Anansi said, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just being frank with you. Your voice sounds so horrible, devil. I wasn't impressed with your song at all. 
I'm not offended, don't worry. The cat is never impressed, no matter how well a mouse dances, Onofu replied. Anansei then thought in his heart, Why don't I take the devil to the godlands to find out whether that which he talks about in his song is true? He then asked Onufu, Where are these lands that you sang about? Onufu answered, The entrance that leads to the godlands is right here in this garden, master. Anansei said, I will like to journey with you to the godlands before I kill you at the end of the journey. Onufu then said, Your wish is my command, master. A thirsty human being doesn't care about the purity of the cup from which he drinks to quench his thirst. I'm in a hurry to deliver your head to my people, so let's execute this mission quickly, Anansei said. Then let me prepare for you the Soma of the Gods to drink. Then we shall embark on the journey. The snake prepared ayahuasca brew made from the leaves of the psychotria verita shrub, along with the stalks of the benisteriopsis capivine. He gave it to Anansei to drink, then instructed him, Position yourself at the northern side of my abode. Face northward. Take three steps forward and tell me what you see on the ground. Kawaku Anansei did as instructed. I see two holes, one to the left and the other to the right. In between these two holes is a round metallic plate. Onufu added, Look closely into the two holes and tell me what you see within them. Kawaku Anansei did as instructed and said, I see a pot containing water in one of the holes, and the other hole contains a burning coal. Onufu then said, Beneath the round metallic plate is the path to ubiquitous. The metal that you see is a eutectic fusible alloy with a melting point of 70 degrees. It's an alloy of 13.3% tin, 26.7% lead, 50% bismuth, and 10% cadmium by weight. The metal melts. When it comes into contact with hot water, 70 degrees Celsius in temperature. Boil the water on the coal and pour it on the metal to open the way for our journey. Kawaku Anansei did as instructed, and the metal melted. Beneath the opening was an underground tunnel. Onufu then descended from the tree and entered the tunnel. He then shouted from inside it with a very deep voice, Follow me! Let's journey to the godlands! They journeyed through the tunnel for seven hours, and then they came to an opening, filled with water. 